Hey everybody, Merry Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. Here we have today two uh, nodes that I want to show you. Uh, you can download this as uh, the, the materials and the uh, actual node graphs on my website for free. Um, this will be the in-paint tool, uh, but first we're going to go with the grid warp tracker. And these are both new nodes inside of Nuke 12. So we're going to go ahead and get started on this. All right, so go ahead and load up the uh, grid warp underscore track underscore start uh, with the materials of the free download below. And again, everything should line up perfectly. Um, you can see it's going to have this file direct value root name. Um, I do have to set the uh, color space in this weird, which was sRGB because I was exporting out of Resolve. And I was having issues, so whatever. Um, anyway, it works. So let's go ahead and just open up a grid warp tracker. Now, this is like the big brother of the uh, grid, uh, let's see, yeah, the grid warp. Yeah, so the grid warp is always the one that's always relatively easy to understand. It's got a very lo uh, similar look, destination, source, uh, background. The only thing new here is this uh, smart vector. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So you can plug this straight directly in, and it looks very much like the grid warp tool, except it's incorporating almost like helper information smart vectors. If you're not familiar with smart vectors, uh, check out my uh, Nuke 104 class, I believe. That's free. I go over how to use that for um, sort of cosmetic work and so forth. But uh, again, I'm going to go ahead and open, uh, take this and go to Smart Vectors. And again, uh, by the way, this note will not appear of any earlier versions of Nuke. This has to be Nuke 12, so just be aware of that. So again, I'm going to plug in this as the uh, source file. And Smart Vectors are going to be calculating... I usually put my smart vector details maybe up to like 0.4. And if you just plug into the smart vector uh, path, you can go ahead and see, I'll go ahead and put my properties into one, that if I go over here to the smart vectors, there's information being calculated here. Uh, it's almost like a 3D tracker. Uh, it's, it's taking points of contrast and establishing velocities based on the before and after frames and so forth. So um, there's a whole bunch of information here that is going to be used to help understand where everything's moving around on the face. So this stuff can be used for um, all types of things, morphing different uh, creatures from orcs to human to transforming someone to werewolf. In this case, we're going to take my friend Rev here and we're going to grow his nose and make him kind of like a monster. Um, we're also going to uh, fix some of his uh, acne that he's had over the years, and then we're going to transition between that uh, later on in the, in the next lesson. But anyway, um, smart vectors are calculated. Sometimes you want to actually write these things out uh, as EXR files and then bring in the information. Um, but in this case, this actually calculates really relatively quick, especially with Nuke 12. So let's go to the grid warp tool. You want to plug in the vectors, smart vectors right there. You do have this optional de uh, um, de uh, destination nodes, which we'll go into. So if you don't, are not familiar with the grid warp tool, I'll put my viewer to it, um, you'll usually kind of just track a certain area and then you can warp it and so forth. And um, it, it's kind of like just a warp tool. The spline warp tool is another tool that's being, that's used that's a little bit more detailed. And that's used more for more accurate morphs between two characters. Um, there was a feature film I did called Thrill Ride, which we actually had to do a morph uh, between Kristen Johnson and a statue. So it was a movie. Check it out on iTunes if you guys are interested in seeing my work. I have VFX supervised three feature films, uh, mostly in the Chicagoland area. All right, so I'm going to go to the draw boundary here, and we'll go ahead and draw this out. Now, the way I like to work is I know I'm only going to be working on Rev's face here, maybe his ear, so I'm going to go ahead and just draw out a general square like this. Again, spline warp tools can be used uh, for this uh, a little bit better. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the options on this node. So right here we have the output either as warp or morph. So if I put it to warp, I'm sorry, uh, the background is set to black. So this allows you to have an alpha version of it. So if you hit A for alpha, it's clear. Or you can go to the source file and just leave it to uh, overlay on top. Okay. So Again, it's probably important to come to your read node and actually click on Auto Alpha if you don't have an alpha. So again, it just gives you an alpha automatically. Okay, so we are going to stick for now with Source. We're going to go back to Black eventually and so forth. And then the output is either Warp or Morph. Uh, the Warp uh, basically goes with the Source material, and the Morph includes the option of the Destination material, or the uh, Destination node, uh, which is 
mixing between the RGB information of the des uh, destination and then the, the warping going on by the grid warp. So we're going to leave this to warp for now. And then you have the warp amount, which is already set to 1. Now the trick is when you're doing this is that before we do anything, I'm going to put my viewer not to the grid warp tool, but to the read node for now, because we're going to be distorting the plate. And if we don't do this, it's going to be bad news. You're going to see the warping. So make sure your viewer is set to the actual read node and not the actual grid warp tracker node. So you'll see at the bottom here we have divisions. Now I can up these divisions. As you can see, it'll increase the divisions. You also have the gang, which you can turn off, and then you can get more uh, you know, horizontally than vertically, and then you can turn gang on, and then they will link together. So it's going to be a one-to-one -one ratio. So I start out small, maybe like this size. And I'm going to go ahead and make sure I have the from selected. And I'm going to make sure the visibility of the two is turned off. So I'll turn that off because there's actually two sitting right on top of each other. So I'm going to take the from and make sure that's there. And as you can see, you can actually change the color of the outline. So if I come over here and click on this, I can change the color of that. So now it's this kind of lime green color. I can also lock it. So it gives these little X's. Um, I can turn off the visibility of it like that. And this right here is whether it's active or not. Okay, so we're going to get into that a little bit later. And then you have the link. So make sure the from is selected. Make sure your viewer is to read node. And now we're going to start laying this lattice down by just kind of keeping it on the outside of Rev here like this. So I'm just moving along his face. I used to be a character artist for NetherRealm Studios and... I did a lot of character work for Mortal Kombat, so I'm used to like f following uh, snare lines and uh, you know laugh lines and so forth on a face. Now, a grid, it's not necessarily right. If you guys have done any 3D modeling, you're probably well aware that you don't model a face with a grid, which is uh, going to really mess you up if you try to do deformations for in-game facial wrinkles and all that fun stuff. So I'm kind of roughly trying to follow... Uh, his face here and usually you do like the, the Zorro mask around the eyes and then the lines usually come down so I might do something like this for now just get the grid working okay so if you want at this point you can either start adding divisions uh, but what I'm going to do is pop back here and this is the real cool thing is I could take the divisions now that I've kind of paste uh, kind of like a general uh, macro level. I'm going to put this to 5, 6, 7, like that. So I'll go to probably about 8. And you can start, you know, you, you can define this slowly and you know, go to 6. And now you can start making a couple adjustments here. So maybe I'll use this to follow up the, the eyebrow, get like some kind of deformation in the eyebrow. You want to space these things out. You don't want them to be too, too crunchy and so forth. So I'm trying to get some kind of, uh, and you can hold down control and actually break some of these tangents if you wish. So I'm trying to move along the snare line and the face like that. Okay. So then again, I can come over here to the grid warp tool. I'll take my divisions and give, give myself even more divisions. If I want to, I can actually just come here to this insert mode and add a line individually like maybe I want more detail around the eyes and then I can use the minus key to get rid of other pieces so again you can also do split Y oops make sure I got this selected you can do split Y you can do all types of split X so you can split these again a lot of this is a uh, kind of repeat of the grid warp tool all right so I'm gonna go ahead and just try to kind of get this moving along his eyelid here and like that, there we go. I'll just get a little bit of cushion and then move along the curvature of his eyebrows like that now. And then of course, this, just let it kind of flow down the face. And then I'm gonna start adding some uh, deformation information on the lip here, because maybe I wanna do something with the lip and we're gonna probably wanna do a little bit more information there we go. And that's probably good enough. Now you don't want, if you do too many, you're going to have a nightmare on your hand. Um, so again, you can see that's a good start. Now, if we turn on our two visibility, you can see it's exactly as uh, it originally is, and it needs to be linked up to this. So what you can do is you can either come from the front tool and say, copy keys, or copy all keys, 
come over here and do paste keys, okay? Or you can just link these two with this linker. So now they're linked up, now they're overlaying. So if I kind of turn off uh, the green, you can see this kind of, uh, you know, bluish pinkish is the two. And here is the from. So I still have the from selected. And we are ready to rock. Okay, so now we have to track this. Now, before you track, there's something to be aware of, of a couple of options up here. There is um, a couple things here, if we kind of take a look, just to be aware of. you got your general toolbar for transforming handles. So you can see if I take this and move it, there's that. Uh, there's also your ripple edit tool, which moves all keyframes. If you have keyframes, you can see we currently have a keyframe on page, uh, frame 26. And you can see you have this toolbar auto key, which I can turn off. And if I were to move over here and obviously drag this, you can see it's not going to allow me to do it because I need to turn on auto key and then I can move it. Okay, so we haven't done any tracking yet. I'm going to go back to my quote unquote reference frame here that I've actually, there has to be at least one keyframe down. And that's what we have here at frame 26. And again, you want to make sure, like I said before, that it, these two are overlapping to the same. So you can turn on and off the overlapping to and from. So again, I'm going back to the from here and taking a look. And you have a couple options. This one is always enable, which is hovering. So if you hover over it, it tells you the color. So you can see it even tells you right here. Uh, when hovering over, it shows you the color and the name of the grid. So it's the from, which you can label here and uh, so forth. And then you have the this other option here, which is toolbar label point. So if you click on it, uh, which I should have done, if you click on it, 210, this works from a grid from bottom to top. So 1 to 1 is the bottom left hand, and then up here is 1119. So I have, it's like 11, 11 rows or 19, uh, uh, yeah, you know, whatever. So I'll just go ahead and turn that off because that's a little bit too much information that I need. And that's it. Now, tracking information, tracking rigidity. If you can kind of hover over this, you can see what it says. The higher the value is, the more rigid the track grid will, will be. Conversely, the lower the value, the more the grid will stick to the smart vector movement. Okay, so we're at a very low value, okay, which is going to bias more towards using the smart vector information to help us get the tracking information. So again, by default, you can see the higher the value, the more rigid. So what does that mean by rigid? Well, the grid warp is not going to be the grid warp will get more of the, the big details, like the, the, the macro details. And then the small details are going to be the micro details will be done by the vectors. Now, the only problem with that is um, sometimes the micro can give you weird errors in the very small details. And the macro can give you very er big errors in the, uh, sm uh, the small details. And then the big details can get kind of wonky, vice versa. So you're using the power of smart vectors and uh, a general grid warp. So you're taking a macro and a micro and using the powers of the two to kind of get this to work right. All right, so you be the judge on this. I leave this by default. Again, it's going to be more biased towards um, the uh, uh, actual uh, vectors, but you can crank this up. Once this information is tracked, this connection does not need to be hooked up anymore, okay? Once it's tracked, this information has no play anymore, okay? It's really just give, tracking the information when you track it, which we're about to do right now. We're on our reference frame, so we're gonna go ahead and track forward. So I'm gonna go ahead and say track then. And we have to actually select the grid warp tracker, so go to a from here, and we're gonna track forward. And you can just see it's gonna try to track everything. So remember, this is not, this is a combination of vectors helping the information of the grid warp so that you get really good details. And then if the face changes relatively dramatically, you don't get a lot of swirlies and so forth if you're doing like skin cleanup or anything like that. So it, I found it actually gives you pretty good results. I kind of compared it to my history of using smart vectors for cleanup. And it really seems to be the best of both worlds, which is kind of cool. Now, I probably could have done a better job here trying to uh, kind of get these to, you know, follow along his lips so that I can actually change his actual lip form, but I'm not going to do that. I don't want to insult Rev too much here. All right, so there we go. And now you can see, uh, you can see we got different options here. We can clear forward, clear backward. I'm going to go all the way here to 26, where you can see we've done all the tracking here. And then from this way back, we have to do the tracking. So at 26, we're going to track backwards, tr track to the start. I'll let that go through. 
Okay, so um, let's go ahead and turn, tur you can see our two and our firm are linked together. So if I turn them both on, which they're both on now, they're, they're overlapping and sitting on top of each other. You can see they are married together, they are together, okay? Now at this point, we can go ahead and take the from and hide it, because we don't want to see it. And then we have the two, and then we're going to make start making adjustments to it. Now, with the option here of the toolbar, and it's always good to take a look at your dope sheet and so forth, um, you understand that you have this auto key on. Okay, so that means that if I move something here, okay, I've set a key. Okay, so keep that in mind. I don't want to do that, so let me undo that. Undo execute. So you can see if I it kind of press it through. So I'm going to leave the auto key on, and what you commonly want to do, I find, is that you want to take this two here, and you want to make an adjustment grid. That way, if you make any mistakes, you're not you're not branded to them. What I mean by that? Well, if I hit an adjust, add an adjustment uh, layer, and I'll hide the original two, sort of parent it on top of of the original two. So with that said, you can see the hierarchy coming down here. That if I come in here and make an adjustment, so I'll turn off the key, turn off the keyframe here. You can see there is no keyframes on this adjustment layer whatsoever. Okay. So if I come over here and take this and move it, okay, now I'm not seeing anything because my viewer is still plugged in. So I'm going to put my viewer to the grid warp. And now I've moved his lip out uh, rather severely. Now if you see, if I plug it through, it's staying put, okay? So what I'm going to do is show you that if you don't have this uh, keyframe on, so I'll delete the auto, okay, adjustment layer. I'll create another adjustment layer. All right. And again, I just want to see the adjustment layer. I don't want to see the to. I don't want to see the from. I just want to see the adjustment layer again. And if I do have the keyframe on and I press this out, we have that and it's sticking, but I go to my dope sheet and I move it even more out. Oh, it looks like, you, oh, I'm sorry. We have to have the keyframe down. There we go. <laughs> So now I do that, and then if I make it move, move a couple frames. Now, um, now I'm starting to get keyframes in here. So just be aware that if you really just want to move something um, in a sort of absolute way without animating points, you can just, again, delete the adjustment layer. You can make a million of these if you want. So I can add an adjustment layer. You can add another adjustment layer and another. So one can be parented to the adjustments of the other. So which is really, really nuts. Um, so just be aware of that. But I'm going to take just one adjustment layer here and make sure keyframing key is off. And I'm going to make an adjustment to Rev. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's have a little fun here. I'm going to take his nose and we're going to extend it out like this. It's going to obviously take a little bit of his cheek there. And maybe I'll round it up a little bit. There we go. And I can also take his eye. And you can choose any frame you want while you're doing this. Um, because it's adjusting accordingly. Again, you are not setting keyframes. Okay, so you can see that in the dope sheet here. So I can take this and make his eye really wide. And you'll notice the sharpness details. Sometimes I like to introduce a little sharpness in these areas if I'm taking the resolution and stretching it. So you can see if I just kind of... And you got to move... The more points you have, the more you got to like sort of dampen or soften the transition period. Otherwise, it gets kind of scrunchy. So you gotta like gotta back off these outside points, so I can kind of make him evil. You can see how stretchy it starts to get if you're not careful. Look at the flow of your curves. You know, I, again, I was a character artist, so I remember how you know deformations in a video game would look if our deformations on our facial rigs were too goofy. So now Rev is evil. Um, let's go ahead and just take a look. I've got a big eyeball now, but that's been transitioned through all the animation, as you can see. So he's now got some interesting variations on him. So to expound upon this, you can even go and make an adjustment layer where there's actual animation. So you have this initial deformation you made with no animation. I can come in here and say, add another adjustment grid. And on top of this, I have this grid now, so I'm going to get rid of this one. And now I can make an animation of his nose growing okay, even more. So let's say frame 19, I'll turn on my uh, adjustment layer and we'll take these nodes and you can go ahead if you want and just set a specific key here. So you can say right here and say add key and then maybe 40 frames in uh, with this turned on to add key, we can move this in and make it a little bit ridiculous. 
There we go. So now we have this animation between here and here of his nose, and that's being done on adjustment two. So you can come in here, and I don't think you can rename these yet. I don't see anything about renaming. But you can see if I turn that deformation uh, off and uh, the visibility off, but the thing is what I want to do is I want to turn this off as inactive and inactive. So that specific animation of the nose getting bigger is on this layer, right? So I can turn that off. And then I have this adjustment layer, which corresponds to the general deformation of Rev. So that's him originally, and this is him deformed. So l many layers of deformation you can do here. So I'm going to turn all of these on. And let's go ahead and just take a look. And again, I can come over here to my background, put this to black. Okay. Uh, there we go, black. And then I have, technically, an alpha here, which can be merged onto something else. I'm trying to stick it onto something I'm back. Obviously, this is, doesn't really work really well because you want to get in here with a roto or some key work and get a good um, copy of that. So, all right, so I'm going to put this back again to source. I always usually have it out to source. So now I want to animate the actual animation here. So I can hit Q, uh, hit Q here and do an overlay, hit Q on and off. One last thing I want to mention, though, if I go to this adjustment layer, go ahead and come to this, or I'm sorry, let's go to the animated adjustment layer. You can see we have the two animation keystrokes here. What if I wanted to um, take this and make uh, a general adjustment on both of them, or maybe if I just go back to the, um, it doesn't really matter if I want to make just an adjustment on everything together, I could use the uh, ripple edit tool. So the ripple edit tool just offsets everything. So for instance, if I come over here, and if there's keyframe animations on these keys, right, I can offset these with the ripple edit tool on. If I turn it on, you see you get this really mean looking uh, red here, and I can offset this like that. Now what that does is it even offsets the key at the original to the little bit to the right. So you can see it's already been offset a little bit, so I'll turn that off. So we can go ahead and play through our animation. You can see the stretch. It's looking good. Now we want to animate this. So again, that comes to the warp. Now the warp is using the input source information for the RGB uh, information. So again, I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and hit the letter Q here so I don't see the overlays. And you can see we're already getting a weird artifact here around the nose. And that's because we're warping an area that was brighter over here and moving it on top of the background. It's being overlaid onto the original background here. So what I need to do is do I'm going to have to do a little bit of cleanup work back here by exposing the background of the original plate and do a little roto work and have this overlay. Now before I even do that, we're going to go ahead and animate this. So here's the warp, right? So we'll take the warp and we'll move it in the original. So we'll start out with red being perfectly normal and you can see the warp amount. If I put it all the way up to one, complete warp, bring it back to zero, there's nothing. So at frame 10, I'm going to right click and say set key. And then somewhere around frame 47, he's going to be completely warped. So I'm going to go ahead and you can see it's set, it's set a key here. If you go to your dope sheet, you can see the warp keyframes. So I'm going to go ahead and play this through so you guys can watch it. And I will pause the video to uh, have you guys watch it. So as you can see, this is uh, really taking too much liberty with the stretchability of the nose, but we are getting that weird highlight <laughs> as he, as if uh, Rev is uh, Pinocchio here lying or something. He doesn't look too much like an orc, but there's some weird stuff. This would really, to me, freak somebody out in the theater. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to roto out this as an overlay, and that's going to be what is going to be um, overlaid on the background. So if the original background actually has this exposed background here, so we can simply use that. We don't have to do any uh, replacement of the background or anything like that. Um, say what you would do and say stereoscopic. So for that workflow, we can go ahead and try to pull this off with keying. So I'm going to use a keyer here. And I have a grid, this grid warp we want to set to black because we're going to cut we're going to cut cut it out um as it occurs so you can see if i go ahead and just take a look at this we're going to be cutting this out as the transition occurs all right um, with an alpha but i want to get another version that kind of comes around here so i'm going to take 
this grid warp, and I'm going to copy and paste it. Remember, the smart vector information doesn't need to be connected anymore. In fact, we could probably disconnect this right now. So I'm just make a source version of this. And this one I'm going to set to source just so I can get a transparency or the, a full kind of composite. And I'm going to use luminance information and masks to kind of deal with this. So now I'm going to plug in a luminance mask. And this is where you can uh, use the great uh, advice from Mr. Josh Parks, which is uh, try red, green, blue, alpha, you know, try to use different uh, different ways of keying here, uh, chrominance uh, keyers and so forth. But in this case, I can just take a look and I would say the blue channel, green channel, blue, the blue channel has the highest contrast between these two. So I'm going to use that and I'm going to put this to the blue, blue keyer for now. And again, I'm putting my viewer to this and hitting the A for alpha. And you can see I'm just trying to isolate this out. The highlight of that nose is just too bright. Um, so I'm going to have to worry about that a little bit later. But you can see that's going to have to be planar tracked. But I'm starting to get a contrast of what I need to do here. Okay, so the next one is going to be a roto. We're going to go ahead and do a quick planar track of this footage. So there's my roto node, which we're going to do our planar track. I'll take the roto node and I'm going to go ahead and just do a very simple roto. And the only areas I know that I really need to uh, worry about are these areas right here, where you see the, the difference in the highlight. I don't have to worry about everything else. So I'm going to try to get in here and just roto out this nose area, which has been warped already a little bit. I've kind of got to have it in the middle of the shot. And then I'll just move my way around. I don't have to track anything else. And I will take this right click and say planar tracker. Makes it purple. And now I will track forwards and backwards. I'm in the middle of the shot here, so I'm going to go ahead and track forwards. I'll hit pause. So as you can see, it's it's getting a little bit off track. So I, I usually like to cancel in the middle of the track and then uh, backwards up a little bit where it's kind of lost its lost its way and make a couple adjustments there and there. And it's not going to pick up everything because it's looking for contrast points information to track. And then I could just repath over the animation that I did. So I'll just go ahead and track forward. And it should get a hold of it pretty well. So again, I'll just, just kind of getting to the end there. Anytime that I see that it's getting a little bit too crazy, it needs to have a hand animated point. Remember, with a planar tracker, you're tracking uh, you know, manual po points and regular points. The manual points are on the folder and the, I'm sorry, the manual points are on the Bezier and the auto tracks are done on the planar tracker. So you can see that from the dope sheet. These are the manual points adjustments I've made. So what I do again is I back up until it gets too goofy and I make my adjustments. And again, I'm not worried too much about this area. I'm worried about this little highlight here. Again, this is kind of rough run and gun. The highlight is what is going to never going to get keyed out by the blue keyer. So I have to like be careful with that. And I'm really, this hair I'm going to deal with later. So then I just kind of paint, it's like painting a house. You just paint over the area you painted briefly at the very end. So now you can see we have that. And again, I go back to my reference frame and I'm going to track backwards now. So There you go, and I'll hit cancel uh, along the way, and then back up until things started to get a little bit of wonky. And over, you know, already you can see there's really no at this transition in the morph. It's so similar, you're not getting that highlight. So, you know, question is, do you even want to keep going? Really, it's looking for the artifact you're going to replace. So I'm going to go ahead and just keep let this go to the end. I think. Okay, so now we have a nice tracked uh, nose here and we can take this information and combine it in. So I will use a merge node and I will take this information here and it's important to hit S for settings and make sure that your full size format is set to, you can't see at the bottom here, 4096 by 1716 which is a weird aspect ratio of uh, 239 for this. So make sure you hit, come over here, put your cursor here and hit S and make sure your full size format is set to 4096 by 1716. It should already be if you loaded up the file because that's going to force this roto here 
uh, when I disconnect it uh, to be that size. So here's the piece. And then I'm going to take the roto and choose to, um, you can see it's outputting alpha here, right? So if I hit A for alpha, there's the A, a information. So I'll put this B and A and put the merge and hit the A for alpha just so I can see it. And in this case, I'm going to use a stencil. So let's come over here and just do a quick stencil of this. So operation stencil, which takes away. So now we'll do that again with another merge node. This time we will be setting this to uh, mat. Uh, or you can do plus, doesn't matter. And we'll do another roto. And remember, I'm just trying to get contrast in this area here for a mat. Um, I'm also going to blur these. So again, I'll add a blur to this here. Yeah, like that. And it's always good to add a blur just between. And then I, I'll use another roto here. And I'm just trying to separate the black from the white here. So I can come over here, grab that, and flip up my viewer. I got that. So all I need to do is make a couple animations, look for anything weird going on. Yeah, it looks like we're holding up pretty well there. All right. And then vice versa on the other side. Um, again, I'm only worried about this area here. So again, I could get this merge. Do a roto. And copy and paste this blur. And copy and place this blur. And this roto will be on this side. So I'm going to transition this because nothing gets warped except for uh, this area right here. So uh, I think it was just his nose and his eyeball. So I'm not really about worried about his lips. So I can come up through here like this, 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 like that. And then we'll add this as a stencil. There's probably an easier way to do this. If you would like to be a helpful compositor and you're like, hey, dummy, what are you doing? This is a faster way. So I can hit stencil. I'm going to put my viewer to this, though, and continue the animation here. So again, I'll just come over here. Sorry, guys. And just keep this animation going here. So I'm just kind of keeping, being careful as to, and you get a planar track this, too, because this can get kind of swimming artifacts along the edge, but I'm not worried about it. I'm just going to quickly do this like this, like this, like this. All right, cool. So that creates, uh, if you take a look at it, it creates a mat. Okay, and the only area, I'm, again, I'm worried about is this nostril area here. And that mat can be used to merge this. So I'm put a merge in here. This B will be the original footage, and then the A will be the grid warped version, and then we'll bring the invert mask into this. So now if we take a look, take the merge node and take a look at the mask, you can see we have a solution. Now I can come to this blur node here and adjust the blur on that nose. That's the mat itself. Okay. So now, just in a simple little operation, we no longer have that weird artifact. I'll go ahead and take my merge node here and plug that in and out. So now it's, this, it's, it's clean. Okay, so now if we go ahead and play this back, Go ahead and full frame it, and we'll go ahead and watch our magic. Again, I'll make sure mask is turned on this time. Here we go. And let's play it through. All right, so as you can see, we went a little extreme here with the nose, and you can see the stretch stretching area is a little bit too much, and the audience would know it's a digital effect because the upper lip is getting warped as well. So that could be a whole another world of work that you can use with this. I'm just showing you a rough example. Uh, also, my uh, little my work on my uh, roto is a little bit rough. You can see the highlight disappear and reappear a little bit. So again, that could use some work. Um, but you can see that the eyeball is changing. It's a really weird effect. Lord of the Rings, uh, Return of the King, I believe it was. Uh, the deleted scene, they had the mouth of Sauron, uh, where the mouth was enlarged. And it sort of like weirded out the audience. And you could do all types of, you know, if you're working on horror movies, I guess. Uh, but that said, let's go ahead and just go over the last bit of details here on this... Uh, specific node because this is about knowing the nodes uh, and the next lesson will go into the uh, in paint node so anyway uh, grid warp tracker we do have this destination I think it's the last thing we have not covered so the destination uh, changes when the output is set to morph so if I set the output to morph this now becomes valid okay and now you no longer have if it goes to warp this is still animated but the morph is now a morph um, uh, another uh, morph amount. This is a different input. And then the mix, okay? 
So you can see if I go back to the warp here and take a look at this. Again, this is called warp. Go to this. This is called morph and mix. Okay, so you're morphing to a different thing, like a, another uh, something else here. Okay, destination. So this is where you can incorporate other uses of multiple grid warps, spline warp tools to create a morph between two characters. Uh, so anyway, um, we'll go ahead and just do a quick example of this. So if I do like a, uh, let's see, let's do a color grade. So I do a grade here. I'll just put this to the original footage, put this to destination, take the, uh, I don't know, take the gain and uh, bring down the red and the blue. And what you get is just the original footage of Rev looking green. So if I go ahead and go back to the merge, okay, and we take a look at this. So let's just go to the grid wharf here, go to the morph. Okay, now you can see that Rev is here, and then if I take the mix, it's going to mix the original RGB value of the destination input. See that? So again, if you wanted to have a version that was morphing that was, you know, with this grid warp, I could just copy and paste the grid warp, plug it in here. Right? So now if I go back to this grid warp, go through the mix, it's taking into account both of the both those informations okay and the morph is simply the morph itself from original to where it's at so this is kind of bringing in the color information and then the bounding box is in case you have two different types of formats uh, say your input destination is smaller or larger it's going to take either the union or the specific format that's set in your s for settings if you go to s for settings if it's set to format it's going to it's going to go to that basically so it's mixing these two together which is again the same resolution we've been using um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I believe that's it for this specific node. You do have the input option of a mask in here. So again, you could come over here and plug in a mask, right? And that becomes the mask here. So that's the other option on here. Um, you can change the color of your different inputs. You can copy and paste keys, individual keys or full keys. And that's pretty much it, gang. So uh, be here for the next lesson from which we will go ahead and uh, jump into the in-paint tool.